Hello, good morning. This is Dr. A. We are going to uh, jump into bacteria. So these are the first organisms that we're going to look at. Um, and we're going to look at it through cases. So I just found this more interesting. So um, this first case is a 24-year-old female automotive technician. She presents herself at the doctor's office. She complains of fever and pain in her left hand. She has a wound in her left hand. So on physical examination, the patient had a deep wound on her left palm that was oozing pus. She had purplish red streaks running up her left arm. That's not a very good thing. And she had enlarged lymph nodes at the elbow and under the arm. The patient's skin was warm and dry. In her history, the patient had punctured her left palm, palm with a sharp metal from the undercarriage of a real cherry 1977 Malibu about a week earlier. She said the wound had bled for a few minutes, and she thought she had washed it real good with soap and water. She had covered the wound with a large band-aid and gone back to work. She developed a fever about three days later, and for the past couple of days, uh, she did not feel good, and she had vomiting and diarrhea. Okay, so um, the first poll is I want you to take a guess. Uh, as to which bacteria do you think is infecting her hands? So your um, options, I'll just give you genus here, not genus and species. We have Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, Clostridium, Pseudomonas, and Pasteurella. Okay, so um, pick your choice there of what you think. And this is a um, gram stain from the wound, Dan. So, um, this one is a, like more like a 400 times magnification. So uh, what's relevant in this slide are the dark areas here, which uh, they're kind of hard to see, but they're basically dark staining, dark purple staining bacteria that are round in shape, meaning they are cocci. All this junk here in the background, some of these can be like um, white cells right there, um, right here, and then some of the rest of it's just junk. Okay, so that, that's not relevant. What you're looking at for is these dark staining things here. So these are bacteria. And if you zoom uh, zoomed in, I'll have a little bit cleaner view of it. This is what um, it would look like. So they are dark purple staining round bacteria, and um, they are occurring in clusters. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about bacterial shapes and stuff like that. So uh, the first what we just looked at are, uh, is a first shape, and they're round, and you cannot call them round. Uh, you have to call them, um, they're a cocci, that would be the plural. Caucus is singular, and that is the appropriate name for the round bacteria. Um, and so in our example, um, in our options, two of the round bacteria, two of the cocci, are staph and strep. So those were two um, of the possibilities, staph and strep, okay? Both staph and strep can actually cause, cause wound infections. Um, the other bacterial shapes are rods or bacillus. Um, this is one where um, you can use either one. So you can't call a round bacteria round. You have to call it cocci, coccus. Um, but you can call a rod shaped bacteria a rod or a bacillus interchangeably. And bacilli is a plural of bacillus. So um, you can have anything from these short rods there to these kind of like club shaped rods to some longer rods, some really long rods, kind of skin, you know, some fat long rods and stuff. If it is a shorter, because it almost looks round, we can call it a cocobacillus, meaning it's kind of a, a in between a cocci and a bacillus. So those are, they're a little too elongated to truthfully be a cocci, but they're, they're so short that they, they aren't quite a rod either. Okay, so these are gonna be the two most popular shapes that you're going to see, cocci and uh, bacilli. There um, are also rod ones that are comma shaped, so they have a bend in them, right? And uh, so these are Vibrio, cholera is one of them. So Vibrio is that comma shape. And then you have a, a couple of twisty ones. So we have Spirillium, which um, Spirillium is one that looks like a corkscrew. That's what it uh, looks like. Um, and then the spirochete, it, it is also a spiral shape one, uh, looks more like a spring, 
but it also has a flagella that's wrapped in there and uh, allows them for uh, it to move around and stuff. And then you have occasionally also branching filaments um, like streptomyces. But honestly, the first two here are the most common and you absolutely need to be able to recognize and name them to between cocci and bacilli. Okay, so then, uh, so those are the bacterial shapes. We also describe bacteria by their arrangement. So uh, their arrangement is going to be a function of how the cell division occurs. So from a bacteria, a little round bacteria, cocci, we're going to start with cocci cell arrangements. Um, and if they divide on a single plane, so meaning they go from one to two and then another one and another one, they're on a single plane, okay? You can go, um, if they tend to just occur in pairs uh, where there's two of them, so there's two bodies side by side, they are diplococcus or diplococci. Um, so diplo means two and they just have two cells. So um, cocci in pairs are diplococci. Uh, here's an example right here of some diplococci. Uh, Nasseria gonorrhea is one that is a diplococcus. All right, and then if they uh, are longer than that and they look like chains of pearls, um, they are streptococcus. And so um, they can be a variable length, so they can be short, short chains or long chains. Uh, but either way, if it's a chain, the strepto means chain. So a streptococcus is a round um, cocci, so cocci that occurs in chains. Uh, and obviously, streptococcus looks like that. It is a uh, round bacteria that occurred in chain. So um, if the division uh, occurs on perpendicular planes, so two planes make an X, okay? So uh, then you can have these packets here, um, which are basically, well, these are tetrads, and then these really are pack packets. So uh, the tetrads are little uh, packs of four, um, all, you know, they're all attached, okay? So that's a tetrad. Tetrad means four, okay? And if they, they continue dividing like that, you can actually have what are called sarcinas, which are uh, packets of anywhere from 8 to 64 and they make these cube shaped um, or organizations. Um, in the student lab we have occasionally seen tetrads which is a real they're really cool because they're very geometric um, and they're they're nice to see. And then if you have divisions on multiple planes so you have the, uh, the cross and then but then added some more planes there um, they will make these irregular clusters which are called we usually refer to them as grape-like clusters because they look like bunches of grapes um, and the the word for that is staph um, so staphylo cocci uh, means cocci in grape-like clusters and that was uh, what we saw on the slide from our patient um, and so um, again here it is here is our um, bacteria so nice and zoomed in and from her hand so I want you to write down its shape and its arrangement and then um, gram stain so um, these being dark purple I will tell you are gram positive okay and we're going to get into that here in a few slides all right so write down your shape and arrangement um, and so let's talk a little bit about bacterial cell wall it helps determine the shape of the bacteria. So the bacterial cell wall lies on top of the cell membrane and it makes the bacteria strong and uh, it allows it to not burst or collapse under osmotic pressure and it allows to live in a variety of environments. Um, and our cells our human cells, we're going to study about that in, the, in a couple of chapters and when we look at eukaryotes, do not have cell walls. We have cell membranes, but we don't have cell walls. So uh, just think of it as a, a fort uh, wall that fortifies the cell and protects it. And therefore, because bacteria have cell walls and we do not, cell walls are a big target for your um, antimicrobials, antibi antibiotics. So um, they basically um, work by disrupting the integrity uh, of the cell wall. So if you think about our, our fort, they destroy 
the the walls of the fort and then that allows breaching and allows destruction and rupture of the cell all right so a gram positive cell wall so um if it stains dark purple it is gram positive uh and the the reason it stains that way has to do with the composition of the cell wall and again i'm going to break down the gram stain in just a little bit so the gram positive cell wall is really thick and it's a homogenous sheet of peptidoglycan. Homogenous means it's peptidoglycan throughout. There's no variation. It's just a big, thick slab of peptidoglycan at the microscopic level, but it's thick in relationship to the, the size of the cell. So it is anywhere from 20 to 80 nanometers in thickness. And uh, it has tachoic acid and lipotachoic acid. Um, that allows uh, the cell wall to be maintained and enlarged as the, the cell grows uh, and also can contribute to certain acid acidic charge um, to the acidic charge on the cell surface, allowing it to uh, react with the gram stain, the crystal violet part of the gram stain. So this is a this graph is a representation of gram positive and gram negative bacteria. So we were talking right here about gram positive, and so you can see. Uh, at the bottom of each of these um, represent is represented the cell membrane. Okay, so that would be the border of the cell holds the uh, cytoplasm and all the the components of the cell that are inside holds it all in one packet, if you will. And on top of the cell membrane, you have the cell wall. And then here's the tachoic acid and lipotachoic acid here embedded. But you can see is one thick slab of peptidoglycan and they've designated it as purple because it is gram positive and it will soak up all the crystal violet stain and hold it in this big old thick wall. In comparison, uh, the gram negatives are gonna stain pink and uh, we're going to look at the breakdown of this in a little bit, but I'll go ahead and introduce it. It has a thin peptidoglycan wall that is squeezed uh, between the cell membrane and a lipid layer. So the lipid layer um, is very similar in composition to um, the cell membrane, but I mean, there's some variance, obviously. Um, and it, again, the, the sheet of the peptidoglycan there is really thin. And it interacts uh, differently with the gram stain where um, it will end up staining pink. Okay, so let's again look at um, cell walls in this peptidoglycan layer and how it is constructed. So um, if you look at the word peptido and glycan, peptides are proteins made of amino acids and glycan, think of glycose, uh, glucose or sugar uh, so that it's made of sugars okay and so um, and there's all kinds of different types of sugars there but uh, you can see here these little stop sign uh, looking molecules are the representation of the these uh, six carbon sugars right there okay and then the yellow linkages are the peptides linking these chains of sugar together making this lattice work uh, and that builds the cell wall. And so if you take this part right here and you zoom in, you get here these two um, gly glycans right here. Um, and uh, the M stands um, for, uh, the G is N-acetyl glucosamine and the M stands for N-acetyl muramic acid. So there you go. Uh, either way, they're sugars. And um, they are attached to these amino acids uh, in this chain. So we have some alanine, glutamate, some lysine, some glycine in here. Uh, they're that will link together and they are linking these chains. And the way the, a lot of the antibiotics work is they disrupt the structure, they, they bind here, preventing this cross linkage uh, and then making it really weak where it won't hold together and then the whole thing falls apart. Okay, so your next question. Um, so what is the composition of this organism cell wall? So we were just looking at uh, the, the organism that's causing uh, the wound. So um, it's gram positive, right? So what is a gram positive cell wall made of? So enter your answer there. Okay, so let's talk about the gram stain a little bit. Uh, before we dive a little bit deeper in the organism that's causing her infection. So um, the gram stain is a procedure that was um, developed 
um, to highlight the differences between these two different types of cell walls. So uh, the bacteria that have the thick peptidoglycan layer um, are going to take up the crystal violet. Um, so initially, the first step of a gram stain is uh, to apply, after you've put the sample on the slide and you've heat fixed it and stuff like that, the first step is to apply the crystal violet and let it sit for one minute. So at that point in time, everything on your slide is going to stain purple. Okay. Um, and then you're going to add what we call Graham's iodine. Graham's iodine just makes the crystal violet stick better to the gram, uh, to, to the, the cell wall. Okay, so it just reinforces that crystal violet, makes it stick really well. So we add the uh, Graham's iodine for one minute. There's a rinse step in between, and rinse off excess after that. Okay, so here now is the, the, the step that makes the, the difference and starts uh, highlighting the differences. So for right now, everything is purple. Okay, whether you have gram positive or gram negative, everything's purple. Then we have um, a decolorizer, which is um, usually like a 90% alcohol um, solution. And when you add this alcohol solution to these bacteria, the crystal violet will remain in the gram positive cell wall. It is bound in there and is not letting go. But, um, the alcohol is going to dissolve <clears throat> the, the lipid layer, the top layer of the um, gram negative, and it will cause all of that dye that was on there to just leave. And so after the decolorizing step, <clears throat> anything that is gram negative is going to be colorless. You will, if you put it uh, the, under the microscope, you wouldn't be able to see them at that point in time. Okay, and um, everything that is gram positive is still purple because the alcohol did not affect the crystal violet in the gram positive organisms. Okay, <clears throat> and then you add um, a safranin dye, which is a reddish dye. It actually really stains everything pink. Um, and so adding uh, a pink dye to, to, a radi to a purple is really not going to affect, it might even slightly enhance uh, the purple color there of the um, gram positive wall, but it's already saturated by the crystal violet. So it just uh, adds a little bit of red to it, but you, you just, it just makes it more purple, basically. And then the, the clear one, the gram negative, uh, you, this is basically what we call a counter stain. You add uh, the saffronin and it will actually restain it. So it was purple, it lost its purple, now it's pink. Um, and that is the last step. And so when you visualize them under the microscope, anything that is gram negative is going to appear pink. Anything that is gram positive is going to appear purple. Okay. So the organism that was growing in her hand was Staphylococcus aureus. So it was Staphylococcus because it was a gram positive cocci and it was occurring in clusters. Uh, streptococcus can cause um, wound infections and stuff like that, but if it had been strep, we would have seen gram positive cocci in chains. And then um, the other organisms were either gram positive rods or gram negative rods, so they were not uh, applicable here in this, um, uh, in this scenario anyway. Okay, so um, one thing that's interesting to note about staph um, is that they, it has on its surface, on the surface of its cell wall, it has different embedded uh, cell bound, cell wall bound proteins that cause um, different pathologies and different, um, what's what we call virulence factors, um, causes different aspects of disease. So, um, and the totality of those proteins are called the surfacomes. So, um, what, what the heck? Basically, it started with the genome, and then we have the epigenome, and now we have the metabolome. We have the surfacome, we have the secretome, and all of that. So it's basically, so it's the t for the surfacome, it's the totality of the proteins that are found on the surface of an organism. So staph has fibronectin binding proteins, fibrinogen binding proteins, clumping factor A and B, which all of these can affect uh, clotting, okay? And um, it also has iron regulated surface determinants. So uh, bacteria often like iron. They use iron to enhance division and um, enhance their survival and stuff. And it also has collagen binding proteins, etc. These are all things that make it more able to um, invade your body and to um, also 
counter some of defense mechanisms and stuff. And then the secret home is um, all the little proteins and things that can be secreted. So that means it puts it out there into, uh, if it's in your body, then it puts it out there into your body. So uh, staph can produce enrotoxins. Um, and so if you think enro is so gut related, toxins are gut related. And that's why staph infections can often make the patient like in our case, have nausea and vomiting and diarrhea and stuff like that because it affects the gut because of the toxin. Even though it's in the hand, the wound was in the hand, the fact that it secretes these toxins and these toxins can get into the bloodstream and they go and bind and affect different areas. Um, they can secrete hemolysins, which break down red cells. Um, exfoliative toxins, so these are toxins that if it gets on the skin, it will allow um, the bacteria to basically uh, exfoliate your, your epithelial layer and stuff and you can even have look up scalded skin syndrome where um if it, the infection is bad enough uh and it especially happens with certain strep ones you literally like your skin can just slough off it's kind of crazy so you lose your whole layer of skin uh it can uh, produce coagulase which uh, causes blood clotting around it uh, leukocytins which can kill white cells lipases which can uh, break down lipids and stuff like that and so um quite an asset of different virulence factors. Um, so virulence factors make it more uh, apt to cause disease. So um, I just want you to list one of the virulence factors I just listed, I just talked about, had a whole bunch of them. Uh, so just go ahead and just list one there. Okay, so let's look at a, another case. So um, in this one, a four-year-old girl presents at the emergency room with bloody diarrhea, fever, and vomiting. The child's mother reports that the child has had these symptoms for about 24 hours, and she had not passed any urine for about 12. So that's not a good sign again. Uh, the child is enrolled in a daycare center, and the group had recently made a field trip to a fast food place to learn about different jobs. The children had lunch of ground beef, so obviously hamburgers, fries and cola after meeting with different workers. Um, this field trip was four days earlier on a Friday. The child had a temperature of 39 Celsius, um, which is, you know, uh, basically a couple degrees above. So it's it's above 100 Fahrenheit for sure and showed uh, physical signs of dehydration. Uh, the blood samples drawn showed evidence of greatly reduced kidney function in lost red blood cells. So this is a bacteria that is causing her bloody diarrhea that uh, is shutting her kidneys down. <clears throat> and it is tied to fast foods, especially hamburger. And it would be tied to um, hamburger meats that were contaminated and not fully cooked. So um, if it's uh, there's a slight pink tinge in the center of the hamburger, uh, which sometimes can happen if they haven't properly thawed their burgers or cooked them too fast or not cooked them long enough and stuff like that. Uh, and a kid may, may or may not pay attention to that and they probably just going to eat their burger and not really know. Okay, so um, the first one is I want you to guess. So what would be the possible diagnosis organism responsible for this infection? So what would you think it would be um, knowing um, it was related to hamburger meat and there are recalls um, that happen on a pretty much on a regular basis um, and where a hamburger meat has to be recalled because it is contaminated with this specific organism. Okay. So um, I'm going to roll this one out. So it's E. coli 0157H7. So E. coli are really a large and diverse group of bacteria. And E. coli is actually part of the normal bacteria in your gut and in the gut of a lot of animals, including cows. Um, and most strains are completely harmless. So they actually are beneficial, beneficial. So E. coli in your gut helps you to produce different vitamins and stuff that you need. So E. coli is actually really helpful. But um, there are some that can cause disease, some strains of E. coli. So there's some bad guys among all the good guys. Um, and they make a toxin called a shiga toxin. And the shiga toxin means it actually came from Shigella. And Shigella is another gram negative rod. And basically they, they collaborated and one gave the toxin to the other. And then it made the E. coli um, 
you know, capable of causing, you know, bad disease and stuff. So um, it is called, um, the, the, those strains that can produce a t the sugar toxin are called sugar toxin producing E. coli or abbreviated STEC. Um, and when you hear uh, news reports about E. coli infections, they're usually talking about the strain that's numbered 0157H7. So the O and the H's are antigens on the surface of the bacteria that they can categorize and stuff in various ways. And so this particular strain is quite aggressive and it is a sugar toxin producing E. coli strain um, that can cause actually uh, what we call hemolytic uremic syndrome where uh, it can attack the kidneys and stuff. Okay, so this would be the gram stain of an E. coli. Uh, you can all tell, you cannot tell by the gram, gram stain what strain it is. So um, the gram stain right here, you can see there are pink, so there would be gram negatives, um, and you can see that they're rods, and they're kind of short rods, so these, uh, you can describe them uh, between bacilli and cocobacilli, so these would be more like bacilli here, and then this little short guy here would be more like a cocoa bacilli. Okay, so again, you cannot tell if this is a, a good guy or a bad guy uh, E. coli just on the gram stain. It's just, that's a gram stain typical of E. coli. Okay, so let's talk about um, the arrangements of bacilli. We talked about the arrangements of coxa. So a lot of the bacilli are in singlets. And so um, these right here, or in singlets mostly, although you can see occasionally maybe some dub doubles right here, some diplo uh, bacilli maybe right there. Um, and uh, generally, again, singlets is very common for bacilli. Um, so if you see pairs of cells with ends attached, that would be diplo bacilli. So they're, you know, hanging out together. And strepto bacilli, uh, or chains of several cells. So um, if you will, for that one, the the chains are very uh, similar to the streptococci chain. So they're end to end to end. Instead of looking like pearls, they would look like uh, elongated pearls, if you will, to actually really, I mean, long, you, ha you have the, the rods, but they're end to end to end to end, um, making uh, chains, shorter chains or longer chains. Uh, and that would be streptobacilli. Uh, and then palisades are um, when the cells of a chain remain partially attached by a hinge region at the ends, and they actually, so they look like little fences. They're one next to the other, um, and they look like sheets of little, like, fences. And so that would be a palisade. You can see those occasionally. Uh, spirilla occasionally are found in short chains, and spirochetes rarely remain attached after cell division, so spirochetes are usually going to be in singles. Okay, so uh, what would you describe this as the shape, arrangement, and gram stain of this particular bacteria? So you can look at it and just write it out. So I want shape, arrangement, and gram stain. Okay, the structure of the bacterial cell wall. So let's continue um, of that. I'm uh, sorry, the structure of the bacterial cell. And we'll talk a little bit about gram ne negative cell wall in more detail here in just a second. So first of all, all bacterial cells have a cell membrane. So um, not all of them have a cell wall, but they all have a cell membrane. So the cell membrane is the border of the cell and it keeps all its content inside the cell. Okay. The cytoplasm is the goop that's inside the cell. It usually has a gelatinous um, kind of um, structure to it. Uh, ribosomes are usually dotted throughout the cytoplasms, and ribosomes have the function of producing proteins. Um, and so bacterial cells do need proteins. They can secrete proteins. We saw all those virulence factors were proteins that would be made by those ribosomes. Uh, and then you need the proteins that are the antigens on the cell wall and the cell membrane and all that. So there's definitely a need for ribosomes. And then you have the cytoskeleton. So the cytoskeleton is like a network, if you will, kind of a scaffold of proteins throughout the cytoplasm and around the edges of it. Um, and it allows, um, well, it allows stuff to flow back and forth between the cell, but it also allows the cell to have a specific shape. But that shape is... Um, usually reinforced by the cell wall, but if that cell lacks the cell wall, the cytoskeleton is what is responsible for the shape of the bacteria. 
okay, because there are some that do not have a cell wall. Uh, and then um, all bacterial cells have at least one chromosome. Some of them might have a few. Um, usually they're in a loop. Uh, they're circular chromosomes. Um, and then most bacterial cells do possess a cell wall, although you cannot say all because there are a few that do not have a cell wall. Okay. Uh, and most of them also have a surface coating called a glycocalyx, um, which protects them. So that would be on top of their cell wall. And we're going to go over that here in just a second. So uh, some, but not all bacteria could possess uh, either flagella, pili, or fimbriae. So flagella allows for locomotion. It swim, you know, swim motion. Pili, um, we're going to come back to that later in this class, but it's a way to pass genetic material back and forth between two cells. Uh, it is often um, referred to as like bacterial sex because they literally are joining together through this pill line. It's like a little bridge and then genetic material can go back and forth between the two cells. And then fimbriae are uh, basically what I call bacterial Velcro. They're little uh, attached, um, like, yeah, little filament attachments that make it, al uh, allows it to stick to tissue and stuff uh, and make it harder for your body to flush it out. Um, some of them have an outer membrane, so there would be a membrane on top of the cell wall. Um, some of them have plasmids. So plasmids are uh, small sections of DNA. They're just like a, one or two genes coded, and it's a section of DNA separate from the main chromosome. Okay. And they have inclusion bodies. So inclusion bodies are vacuoles of stuff that uh, the bacteria has ingested or that's storing in a vacuole that's just floating around uh, in the cell uh, cytoplasm. Uh, some of them can make uh, endospores. So um, endospores are a way for the bacteria to survive and to conserve its genetic material. And I will sh we'll, I'm going to have a slide about that here in just a minute. Um, and then um, they can have some intracellular membranes. So part of uh, so the cell, it's got like the cell membrane, except you have some on the inside. So not all, some, but not all can have any and all of those features. So um, they're all represented in this picture. So we have our um, cell membrane here, cell wall. We have a, a potential outer membrane right here. Um, and then we have a glycocalyx uh, membrane here, especially the, the sticky stuff. Um, and so some of these would represent a uh, fimbriae, this represents a flagella right here, this represents a pili right there. If we go to the inside, the little dots are ribosomes. This little mess of stuff here, zigzags, are chromosomes right here, so the genetic material. A couple of these things here would be inclusion bodies, right? And then this little section here uh, on its own is actually a plasmid. So it's genetic material separate from the chromosomes right there. Um, I do believe I covered everything there. Okay, so um, of those, what are the basic cellular components of bacterium? That means the, what do bac all bacteria have? So list what does all bacteria have listed there? Okay, so let's talk now a little bit on the gram-negative cell wall. Um, so it, as to differentiate it with a gram-positive. So if you remember, we just said the gram-positive cell wall is a nice thick um, layer of peptidoglycan. It's just single layer. It's peptidoglycan, and that's what it is. Okay. So the gram-negative cell wall is only, it's very, it's a single thin sheet of peptidoglycan. It's only one to three nanometers in thickness, so much, much, much thinner than the one on the gram-positive wall. And the thinness gives gram-negative walls, uh, a cell, so sorry, greater flexibility, but also greater sensitivity to lysis. So they're easy, easily ruptured. Um, and then they have an outer membrane. So the outer membrane sits on top of that single sheet of peptidoglycan, which it sits on top of the cell membrane. And uh, again, that outer membrane is similar in construction to the plasma membrane. It is made of lipopolysaccharides uh, in, um, instead of your um, uh, phospholipid layer, a biphospholipid layer. It is also a bilayer. Uh, 
And uh, the lipopolysaccharides in there um, have are signaling molecules and receptors uh, that are embedded there in that, uh, again, um, phospholipid layer. That's the outer membrane. Um, this lipopolysaccharides can uh, function as an endotoxin. So an endotoxin is endo is like inside, so it's part of the bacteria. And so what happens is if there's an infection with gram-negative bacteria and uh, your immune cell cells are attacking it or the antibiotics are attacking it and the uh, the bacteria are blowing up, they're rupturing, they're, 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 all of their components are just, you know, bursting into pieces. The pieces of this outer membrane of this lipopolysaccharide, these lipopolysaccharide pieces function as toxins. And they will go give you a lot of the signs and symptoms of disease, including they'll increase inflammation, they'll trigger fever, they will... Um, cause um also um the malaise the, the, the aches and pains and stuff like that associated with infection so they make you really feel like crap they make you feel really sick um and um then you also have some poor in proteins there are special membrane channels that allow only certain chemicals to penetrate uh inside the the bacteria uh, so if it is represented here again same picture as earlier but we're going to focus right here so we have our, so this is our cell membrane. So uh, phospholipids right here layered. Then we have our thin peptidoglycan layer, which is going to end up staining pink because it's so thin. Um, and uh, it, it barely, it will not keep the, the crystal violet. And uh, then we have some, um, you see some porins through this uh, outer membrane. So again, in composition, it's very similar, but it has lipopolysaccharides here embedded in it, which aren't in the cell membrane. So we have these lipopolysaccharides and the, uh, their lipoproteins and then these uh, porins that allow stuff uh, through the cell wall to enter. Then, uh, then of course, eventually go through the cell membrane and enter into the cell. Um, and so, yeah, this composition, this is a, the really big distinction between gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria, the cell wall composition. Again, they both have a cell membrane that's very, that's similar in composition. Okay, next question. So again, describe the cell wall composition of this organism. So I want you to basically to describe the cell wall of a gram-negative organism. Okay, the next question in your activity is, is Dibis bacteria modal? Do you know if E. coli is modal? So uh, give it a guess, yes or no, um, on that. And so let's talk about motility in flagella. So um, to, in order to be modal, this bacteria must have a flagella. And so um, the flagella allows it to, to swim around, move around. And there's different arrangements so that you can have a single flagella right here. Uh, you have this called a lophotrichus, so it's like a tuft of flagella, so like, kind of like a ponytail. Uh, you can have one flagella at each end right there. And then you have peritrichus flagella too, um, which uh, are flagella all the way around. Um, so if you remember in the tools of the lab, we're talking about media and growing stuff on plates. And we saw the nice little round mounted colonies most of the time. If the bacteria isn't modal, it'll make nice rounded uh, colonies. So they grow on top of each other and just keep adding and adding and adding. Okay. If they're modal, they will be flat and they'll spread because they can move around. So they're automatically going to want to spread out. And if they're really modal, they'll swarm the plate and they'll just spread all over the plate. Okay, so let's talk flagella here. Uh, and so um, the way the flagella is, is it is um, embedded through the cell wall, through the outer membrane, and into the cytoplasmic membrane through these rings. Uh, and so this is microscopic structure that we're like at the molecular level. This is an electron microscope picture of the structure of a flagella. And it has a hook. And because it has a hook, that can give it direction, right? I can give it like spin. Uh, and, and then the filament is the lengthy part of the flagella. But it's that hook that allows that flagella to, to, to 
basically function as a propeller in a boat. Okay, so um, yes, E. coli is modal. It can move around. And so the way does uh, motion works for bacteria is they can tumble around or uh, gather all the flagella or the single fl flagella and twist in, uh, in a one, one direction, and that allows to propel it forward. And then it can tum tum tumble around and it can go forward. So that kind of makes it make more like zigzag motion. And if there's no attractant or repellent, they'll just basically move around and just tumble and go straight and tumble and go straight. But they basically aren't really moving around. They're just like moving around in a room or whatever. They're, they're just in one kind of general location and they're fine where they're at and they're just kind of just tumbling around. Okay. But if there's something that attracts it, so maybe there's a nutrient nearby and it can sense it because the chemicals uh, would uh, diffuse and bind on the cells um, on the surface of the bacteria and signal it that, oh, this is food, there's food over there, uh, it's going to head towards the buffet, right? So it's going to go um, towards the buffet and it's going to go, it's, it's going to have directionality to its run and tumbles. So uh, the runs are going to bring it closer and closer towards that um, nutrient that it's looking for. It can also move away from things. So if there's a poison or something that's harmful to it, it can move away from it. All right, next question. This bacterium has a milder form. Um, so we're talking about E. coli. So we, there's a milder form, not E. coli 157, and it causes another type of infection. So what really common type of infection can E. coli cause? And we're not talking about E. coli 0157. We're just talking about the plain old E. coli. Uh, can it cause bladder infections, wound infections, lung infections, or brain infections? <laughs> All right. Put your guess in there, and ta -ta -la, if you guess bladder, you are correct. So um, because it is normally found in the colon, and uh, as you can see, here's the exit of the colon and the anus, and in females especially, that exit is not very far from the urethra exit. If, uh, especially if little girls don't, um, if they wipe back to fronts instead of front to back, they can, they could wipe some of the E. coli bacteria towards this entrance of the urethra. And then since these little guys are mobile, they can actually find their way up the urethra and get into a bladder. And then that is nice and warm and moist and gets food there for them to eat and all of that. And so, um, they can get there. Um, it can also be bacteria from the skin, simply from the hands, uh, especially if hands haven't been washed. So very common cause of bladder infection. So uh, let's briefly talk about fimbriae. Again, so fimbriae uh, illustrated here are bacterial Velcro. Um, and so that allows, um, they're usually all the way around. I, I, I call it bacterial Velcro. Um, it's an attachment uh, function. It serves an attachment function so that it, if it gets in, if it can attach itself on a tissue and not be flushed out by a sneeze, by mucus, and by things that are flowing by and not be carried off, they can stick, then they can stay and cause infection and get established. Um, so, yeah, so fimbriae allow the bacteria to stick to the surface that they have uh, attached themselves to. So again, uh, fimbriae are this like hazy thing all the way around it. So again, just think of it like Velcro and then the pili here connecting these bacteria or these bridges here through which they can send usually in the form of plasmids, some genetic material back and forth. And so when we were talking about uh, the shiga toxin, you can imagine, for example, this is shigella and this is E. coli and shigella is sending the sugar toxin over to the E. coli, and now the E. coli has the capacity to um, produce that toxin. This also often happens, and this is not just between uh, gram negatives, so it's just any between any and all bacteria, this stuff can happen. Um, they can also uh, confer resistance uh, codes to different uh, antibiotics and stuff between different species. So um, that's one of the mechanisms of antibiotic resistance. 
Okay, so let's talk about uh, the um, glycocalyx. Um, so um, first of all, we have um, S-layered, and we're going to talk glycocalyx and stuff. So S-layers are single layers of thousands of copies of a single protein that are linked together like chain mail. Um, and it's protective, so it's like a little protective anchor that it puts on its outermost. Um, and, it's, and the S-layer is only produced when a bacteria are in a hostile environment and their survival is threatened, and they will put that layer up to try to protect themselves, to keep themselves from dehydrating or uh, from rupturing and stuff like that. Okay, the glycocalyx, really, really common. So it, this one is a, a coating of repeating polysaccharides. So um, saccharides are sugars, right? Or glycoproteins, which are sugar proteins. So it's either made of nothing but sugar um, polysaccharides are multi-unit sugars or glycoproteins, which are sugar protein uh, sub, you know, subunits put together. And what is sugar? Sugar is sticky, right? Uh, and it's thick. Um, so it's a slime layer. It's a sticky slime layer. Uh, it is kind of loose uh, and it protects against the loss of water and nutrients. Um, and um, so that's a slime layer. If the, it gets really tight and thick, it's a capsule, so it's more tightly bound sugar. It's denser, and it gives uh, mu mucoid characters to the colonies on the artist. So um, if um, a bacteria produces a capsule, when uh, you look at it on the agar plate, on your picture dish, the colony appears very wet, very slimy kind of because um, of that glycopalyx. Um, and then, again, capsules are formed by many pathogenic bacteria. Uh, it allows that bacteria to have greater pathogenicity because it can uh, withstand harsher environments and then often can withstand maybe some antibiotics and antimicrobials and stuff because it can't get through that capsule layer. Um, it can also protect against phag phagocytosis, which is what your white cells do when they eat bacteria. So uh, it can prevent the, the white cells from being able to eat a bacteria that's in a capsule. Uh, or if it does eat it, it can't break it down because it cannot get through that capsule layer. So it makes it definitely more pathogenic. And then biofilms are super important, especially in healthcare. We've already mentioned it in the intro, but um, example of biofilms are the plaque on your teeth right here. And uh, it's, it's um, all kinds of different molecules together. And some of them are glycoproteins and stuff, but um, it, it allows those bacteria on your teeth, for example, to uh, be anchored there and it prevents them from being dislodged. Um, and uh, it, it's, it, it basically builds fortifications of mucousy stuff and, and glycoproteins and things um, all the way around it so that the bacteria are embedded in that and um, like any kind of you know, antimicrobials and all, I cannot reach them. It doesn't matter if actual plaque the only way to remove it is like physically brush it off or go have your teeth clean and have it scraped off, right? Uh, but that's just one example of biofilm. Um, you can get biofilms on any kind of catheter. So uh, uh, if, a, if a bacteria can colonize a catheter, it can, it, it can, as it grows, it can form a biofilm to protect itself. Um, and then it doesn't matter what you do, you can't get it loose. And so that's why oftentimes uh, any thing that has any kind of catheter um, tends to have to be changed out. Like IVs have to be changed out, indwelling uh, urinary catheters have to be changed out and stuff, uh, even sometimes central lines and stuff like that. So, uh, but anything that's inserted in the body has a potential of forming a biofilm, even uh, IUDs, which are intrauterine devices. So think of things like Mirena and all that, that are, you know, birth control that's placed into the uterus to, to block uh, the, the sperm and all of that, those things can develop uh, biofilms, uh, pacemakers can develop biofilms and stuff. So anything, any implanted medical device or anything that is inside, that goes, physically goes inside the body that's foreign can develop a biofilm. All right, so again, here's glycocalyx uh, illustrated. So we have our cytoplasmic membrane, our cell wall, pathetoglycan cell wall, and then we have we can have this S layer. So again, it's like that chain mail um, that uh, it will put up in adverse conditions. And then if uh, a lot of them can produce this on top of that, they can also produce that glycocalyx, which can either make a slime layer or a capsule and um, makes it more resistant uh, to drying and dehydration and lysis and all of that. Plus it makes it kind of sticky. 
And so, uh, again, uh, a cerda has the colonies have a mucoid mucousy characteristic. So these are like here. You can see it's got a shine to it. Uh, and if you uh, gram stain and did a capsule stain, so you have a stain, a, count, you know, a counter stain here, you can see this clear area around each of these raw zerbacilli actually represents, this is the space that's taken up by that glycocalyx layer, that uh, capsule or slime layer, that, you know, the glycocalyx. So that would be on a, micro, on a stain, and this would be on, uh, that you can see what the naked eye colonies on an auger plate. All right, next question. Um, how do bacteria stick to surfaces like uh, the bladder or the throat? So uh, give me some uh, an answer out of these. We have Fimbria, Fimbria, I'm sorry, flagella, glycocalyx, and pili. So how could bacteria stick to surfaces? All right. And out of those, how do bacteria pass on genetic material that makes them more virulent? So um, what do they use here of, out of that list? Again, same list to pass on genetic material. And uh, last topic is we're going to talk about endospores. So endospores are dormant bodies. Um, and so again, they're uh, a way to resist adverse, react, uh, adverse environments. Um, they're produced by Clostridia, Bacillus, and Sporocena. Um, and the, the one that's going to be the most re relevant for you in healthcare is Clostridia. So that's Clostridium, also known as C. diff. Well, it's one of them anyway. It's Clostridium difficile, also known as C. diff. Okay, so um, let's explain it in the context of C. diff in healthcare. Okay, so there are two forms of the C. diff. You have it in what we call the vegetative cell and it's metabolically active, and it's actually, it's feeding, it's growing, it's multiplying, and stuff like that. So that would be what's going on in the gut of your patient uh, that has developed C. diff. Now, there's a couple of ways to develop C. diff in um, the hospital. Um, they can be infected um, via uh, somebody that didn't wash their hands and stuff and was uh, with another patient that had C. diff, or um, they can already have it part of their normal um, colonies in their, their gut, which is totally common, but it's usually kept in check by uh, all the good guys that are there. And they're put on some really powerful antibiotics, which knock down the good guys enough that there's not enough competition to keep the C. diff in check. And then the C. diff is going to grow out of control and cause infection. So um, the, the cells that are, the C. diff cells that would be inside the gut are vegetative. They are growing, they are multiplied, and they are feeding and all that kind of stuff. So let's say you, you have a C. diff patient. Okay, so to have an active infection, they're in isolation and stuff. And uh, you go in there and you assess your patient. So you gown up, blub up, do all this stuff, and you assess your patient and all of that. And you brought your stethoscope in and you listen to them and stuff. And um, then you you leave. You let's say you wash your hands and stuff, but you forget to decontaminate your stethoscope. So now your stethoscope's got some vegetative cells on it from the patient of C. diff. Okay, you completely forgot about it. Maybe somebody called you, there was an emergency, something you had washed up, you forgot to decontaminate your stethoscope, and then it completely slips your mind. And now you have a stethoscope with some C. diff on it. You can't really see it, so it's just like a few bacteria and stuff. Well, the, the stethoscope is not a good environment for the C. diff, so it doesn't have any more food or warmth or all the stuff that it needed to have to, to thrive. Um, and so it's going to form a spore and I'll show you the mechanism, but basically it's going to take all this genetic material on its important stuff and put it into a casing that's super resistant. And that sucker can live for a very, 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 very long time. Um, we have found endospores in mummies and stuff like that, and you can reactivate them and stuff. So yeah, that stuff is really hardy. It can live for years and years and years. And so, um, what the, the, um, bacteria will do is form spores on your stethoscope. And uh, let's say, you, again, you do not do to contaminate your stethoscope. It's sporulated, so it's, it's little re uh, resistant forms are all over your stethoscope now. And uh, you use, um, next shift, you use your stethoscope 
and again uh, on a patient and you transfer some of the spores to the patient and somehow the patient manages to ingest those or something like that it's you know they're pretty resistant and stuff um, and the, the patient ingests them and then as soon as it gets into a favorable environment of the gut it becomes a vegetative cell again so it's and, and it causes an infection in that patient so as you say use a stethoscope hands that aren't clean are definitely uh, a big vehicle but you know other things objects and stuff like that um, can cause it uh, can can uh, uh, cause the transmission of spores uh, endospores from uh, one patient to the other so um, again endospores can resist extremes of heat drying freezing radiation and chemicals that would normally kill vegetative cells so uh, the chemicals that you have to use to clean after a seed of patient all that are different and stronger than what you would kill you would use to kill normal bacteria so they're very resistant and we'll talk about that this this will come back up again in this class um, and so basically this is an electron micrograph of a uh, endospore so you have um, cl um, clostridium difficile is a gram positive um, rod bacillus here right there so it will actually pack all its genetic material here in this spore form Everything else here will just disintegrate and go away, and this genetic material in the in the spore will uh, be stay resistant and stay uh, in a dormant state, but capable of reactivating. And so again, the the mechanism again is so you have uh, a vegetative cell and begins to be depleted of nutrients because it's not in the body anymore; it's on the surface of some sort, and so. Uh, chromosomes are duplicated and separated and the um, it starts making um, the four spores and then um, the rest of it that's the sporangium and then um, it starts developing more and more here's the early spore so it's starting to make calcifications and stuff like that around it so um, and this is the genetic material that's a copy from that and then again the cortex and outer coats layers are uh, deposited here and then you get uh, at one point in time you get a mature endospore what everything else here is starting to dissolve and then this mature endospore can uh, be released and simply just hang out on, uh, on any kind of surface and then uh, if this is ingested there uh, the spore is ingested uh, then all of a sudden it can basically germinate and it pops uh, activates and pops up and becomes a vegetative cell again and it capable of causing infection and you know it'll survive and stuff like that and then whenever if that vegetative cells gets an area where it's um, out of the body out of the favorable environments it the whole process will start over again and so that's why it can make really hard um, to eradicate these infections and you have to be very careful and it's easy to spread uh, if you're if you don't uh, abide by protocols and stuff it's easy to spread these guys okay so you have another question so what features can help pathogenic uh, bacteria survive outside the body so you can obviously um, select more than one on these so uh, look at these features and select which ones can help bacteria survive outside the body okay and so this is your last slide if you have any questions you put it in there and so this is um, part one of your bacteria lecture and I will have part two uh, up and running shortly thank you